I'll do that without burping in your ear there, Sai. I know, I treat you too well. All right there, you little demons. Jules here for WhatCulture.com, back again with another episode of the awesomely named and awfully hosted Choose Your Own Adventure, the weekly medieval theme format where I, the crown jewels of WhatCulture.com, take a list chosen by you. Yes, you, the person who has a new guest of honour to introduce to the show. Say hello to my tiny new friend who sits on top of my camera when I'm not recording. He is the son of the son of Ogdo Bogdo. Say hello. Wow. Give him a little kiss. Yes, you get to decide what list I doll out to you each and every week. And this week we have none other to thank than <laughs> Nicholas Zanchi. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right for their amazing suggestion of the best seven out of ten games. Now, here's the thing. It's one that Scott Tailford and I have been talking about for ages. We constantly just go like, hey, remember games like uh, Gekido uh, for the PS1? Remember games like PsyOps, The Mindgate Conspiracy? Like, these types of games, they live with us rent-free forever, but they're not perfect. Far from it, in fact, but they're still somehow this beautiful mix of great ideas, maybe not so great execution that just lives on forever as an all-timer brilliant experience. It doesn't need to be perfect and polished, no, no, because that's what makes these types of games, and I'm coining this phrase, brass bullets of games, right? Brass bullets. Make sure that you uh, percolate that through the rest of the community. I want people to know. Regardless, let's have a chat about them today as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com and these are the best 7 out of 10 games and say it with me kids, of all time! Oh yeah, that felt good. Let's do this. Number 8, Mad Max. Okay, though it didn't impress Mad Max director George Miller, 2015's open world Mad Max game from Just Cause developer Avalanche Studio is a bloody blast. And here's the thing, it's not really doing much that's different, but what it does, it does very well, my friend. And I tell you what, when it comes to the vehicular combat, I look to most of its peers and say, could you do any better? Could you? Definitely not you, Batman Arkham Knight. Ew! Now, yes, it can possibly fall into the realms of feeling a bit too repetitive for its own good, but if you picked up Mad Max for a couple of bucks on sale, you'll probably wonder why it was received with such a thunderous indifference near a near decade ago. This game is great, and it still looks fantastic. It is the poster child for games that eagerly crib from better ones, know their limitations, and deliver a bone-crunching good time all the same. Number seven, Mirror's Edge. Now, Mirror's Edge marked an attempt to cash in on the mainstream popularity of parkour in the mid-2000s, and honestly, it was a pretty rousing success in that regard. If you can forgive its gossamer thin excuse for a story, the gameplay is an utter hoot. In fact, if we listen, yes, that is a hoot from the lesser-known gaming owl. Hoot hoot. Sorry, have you seen it? Did you get the binoculars out? Did you see it? Write that one down in the journal. We're keeping track of them, they're endangered. Plus, on top of navigating the levels with balletic and very fancy moves, you could sometimes use melee and other weapons to just punch people right in the face with. It's great, it's great fun. And it combines this breathless energy with a striking visual style to stand out and still looks utterly fantastic today. And though its limited mechanics and short playtime ultimately prevented it from making a deeper impact, it's a gloriously fizzy, Fizzy, I say, romp from start to finish. In an era where muddy browns and earthy greens were the dominant aesthetic, it was so damn refreshing to play a game with some real colour and vibrancy. Combine all of that with an inventive and intuitive traversal system, and Mirror's Edge is a game that succeeds at precisely what it was trying to do, even if it could have been a little bit more. Number 6. Hellblade Senuous Sacrifice Okay, time for a warm take now, and trust me, we're going to be getting very hot later in this list. Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice may be one of the most atmospheric and downright memorable games of the last decade, but that is largely due to its superb art direction and terrific lead performance by Melina Jurgens. Gameplay-wise, however, Senua's Sacrifice is... Drink it in... To be blunt... Pretty boring. From the tedious runic environmental puzzles to the dull repetitive combat, Hellblade's conventional gameplay feels like a, well, kind of an obligation, as though Ninja Theory really wanted to just make a walking simulator, but realised that a game with puzzles and fighting would probably sell a lot better. And that's a sad statement for the industry at large, but still, 
Focusing back on this, nevertheless, Hellblade is a fascinating exploration of mental health and it makes it a tough game to look away from, even if the actual meat and potatoes gameplay is terribly unengaging. And while fans speculated whether Ninja Theory might flesh out the gameplay for recent sequel Senua's Saga Hellblade 2, they basically did the total opposite, making both the puzzles and the combat simplistic to the point of tedium. Cool, thanks. Number five, Until Dawn. Now, Until Dawn is basically the perfect, eh, pretty good for a weekend type of game. It doesn't stick to the ribs, it's a fun ride, and you can just play it in spite of its many, many flaws, actually. It's a shameless love letter to the schlocky horror movies of old and new and future. It's a lot of schlock going on. And this inventive cinematic experience may lack particularly involving gameplay and arguably does go on a little too long for its own good, but the vibes, the vibes, my friend, Sai, the vibes, does it bring it? As someone with a diploma in vibes, I'd have to say, you do. Yes, yes it does, yes it does. Arguably less so with the, what was it, the Dark Anthologies one? I was so meh on that. How did you feel about it? Well, I can't really at the stage. I know you're not here. Just, just talk. Yeah, just but tell the people at home what you thought about it. Did what? You play them. No. Also, show the people at home your, uh, your new Lego collection. Oh, I support. I support it fully. Anyway, yes, the vibes. They weren't good, is what I'm trying to say. This is absolutely a game to play in the dark with a group of friends and a mountain of snacks, ensuring that you'll likely have a far more positive memory of the experience of playing until dawn beyond the actual merits of its own gameplay. Again, there's little here to write home about in terms of game design, but the moody visuals, memorable characters, and compelling performances from a strong cast, including future Oscar winner Rami Malek, make it a damn, a damn, I say, riotous time regardless. Number four, Drive Club. Drive Club, or Drive Club, as I like to call it in this house, didn't get off to the best of start, with Sony's much-hyped racer finally hitting the market after lengthy delays, at which point critics were aghast that it was far from the Forza killer that Sony marketed it as, and instead was just a driving game that was pretty good. Not as catchy, that, is it? But away from the tiring discourse surrounding its release, Drive Club boasted tight vehicular handling and some of the most jaw-droppingly photorealistic visuals of any racing game to this very day. I mean, sure, it didn't offer the most content-rich package out of the gate and the driver AI could have been awake sometimes. But you know what? Developer Evolution Studios continued to support this game with hefty post-launch updates for 18 months, by which point Drive Club felt like a markedly different experience. No, it didn't offer a serious challenge to Forza, but Drive Club did deliver the unpretentious goods for players who were exhausted by the genre's increasing trend towards huge open worlds and always online connectivity. With Gran Turismo and Forza having such a tight stranglehold on the genre, Drive Club's failure to break out kind of just highlights the just solid type of racing game that exists out there. There's so many of them. And then just never going to get a chance to shine because these two big giants are like, ooh, what's that? You're poking your head up above the waves. What's that? It's my ass right in your face. Sorry about that. Number three, Fahrenheit. Now, Fahrenheit was the game that put director David Cage and his studio Quantic Dream on the map. Its unique blend of interactive cinematic gameplay offered an experience like little else out there. But let's be clear. Fahrenheit is also a <laughs> mm, dose of fresh nonsense. Now, this supernatural murder mystery definitely touts a strong opening hook as protagonist Lucas Kane, what a great name, murders a man in a diner while he's possessed, but then falls increasingly prey to the unintentionally comical excesses which have plagued Cage's entire career. Due to the game's rush development, its third act is basically a campy car crash of supernatural hooey, including perhaps the single most unearned sex scene in video game history, and that is really saying something. The result is a game that is delightfully bonkers. It's an ambitious attempt to do something wildly different with the medium, but it's also kind of a rough draft of the superior efforts that Cage would turn in with subsequent interactive dramas like Heavy Rain and Detroit Become Human. And let's just face it, neither of those games are high up there as well. They're both 7 out of 10s as well, because they'd be dodgy. Okay, here's where I'm going to lose a lot of friends. Number two, Marvel's Spider-Man 2. Hey, it's Jules here. Just pull the curtain back a little bit. I know. I know you're annoyed that I put this here. I know that you're probably just smashing that keyboard frustration saying, Jules, you stupid snowy egg 
Why? How? What and where have you done to me with this entry? Marvel's Spider-Man 2, one of the highest, most hyped games that's been released in recent memory, belonging on a 7 out of 10 list. Well, I'll ask yourself, ask yourself this question, my friend. Is it actually any better than a 7 out of 10? Be honest, man. Be real honest. Because let's face it, this game fell far short of greatness. It just wasn't as good as the original Marvel's Spider-Man, which, let's face it, is a 9 or 10 out of 10 game. So if it's less than that, it has to be an 8 out of 10 game, right? But then there's also a lot of flaws and even pacing inconsistency with the gameplay in some areas. It felt rushed, it felt long in some areas. It didn't have that wow factor of the original game either, so maybe that pushes it down another number, and then what do we have here? Oh, hello lads, oh, good to see you down the pub. What's that, oh, seven out of 10, good to see you buddy. Six out of 10, get away, get away. We're nowhere there's nowhere near us, mate. You stink. Seven out of 10, oh, yeah, you bombed, Boosh. But you know what, the positives are very clear to see. It's a gorgeously cinematic title, and it's unarguably one of the very best looking PS5 games ever. The fluid combat is ludicrously entertaining, and swinging around New York City has never felt better. It's just a shame that it's in service of the good but not great PlayStation blockbuster that's superficially entertaining while you're playing it, but it leaves no lasting impact whatsoever. Once you're done with it, you're just kind of like, wait, what was I doing? What the, who? Ooh, that's the owl. The owl's back again. And if you disagree, that's fine. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm not saying that I'm right. It is an opinion, and that is fine. And number one, near. And finally, we have near. Unfortunately, not the automata, potato, potato variety, but it, the original, which may be the most quintessential seven out of ten game in our minds, but ten out of ten in our hearts game ever made. Even for the standards of 2010, the original version of this game looked immensely dated visually, and worse, the environments were straight up boring for the most part. Add to this the weirdly bland combat and repetitive side quests, and near is an extremely flawed game. But it's also one with a profound sense of charm elicited through its story and characters, and let's just be honest, it was hypnotically weird. Plus, the music is unforgettable, the voice acting is terrific, and it does more than a few unexpected things with its gameplay that slyly push the envelope. It really did just lay the groundwork for the vastly superior Near Automata, Potato Potata, and also its own much improved remake, Near Replicant, but OG Near is ultimately just a clunky, ugly duckling that proves just how far a little personality can take you. It is what I have imbued as a human. I know I'm a weird looking creature. I know that I'm a bold gremlin that pops up in your subscriber feeds every single week, but I've managed to get far with just having a little bit of sass and a whole lot of. <laughs> Okay, we're done. We're done here, we're done. But there we go, my friends. Those were some of the best seven out of 10 games of all time. Or as I am coining, the brass bullets of gaming. Let me know what you think about it down below. Let me know what your brass bullet of gaming is down there as well, because who knows? I may come back around the Bureau de Change one more time and take all of your picks and maybe we'll expand that into a little episode as well. That would be fun. I'd enjoy that a lot. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Firstly, why not follow me over on the social medias over here and my lovely editor Sai over on her social medias over here. Please follow her. She puts up with a lot with me recording all of these. But I do just want to say one thing as well. Even though we spoke today about games that were 7 out of 10, they had some flaws, but we love them regardless. Let's internalise that message for ourselves. Because sometimes, believe it or not, we're not perfect human beings. We make mistakes. We F up. We don't achieve our full potential, as my teachers once told me, for five years straight. Sometimes you can be imperfect. But you know what? That is okay. Everyone is a little bit imperfect, and we shouldn't beat ourselves up for not achieving or being that idealised version that either society or our own mental self tells us to be. All we need to do is be kind to ourselves, be kinder to ourselves, and keep being kind to ourselves in the future so that we can live a healthy and happy life. So long story short, treat yourself with love, because you bloody well deserve it, okay? As always, I've been Jules, you have been awesome, never forget that. I'll speak to you soon. Bye.